for your attendance, and let me thank the congregation here uh, for the invitation to come speak. I've got a lot of folks in this room tonight that are close friends of mine, and if I start naming them, I'm going to get in trouble because I'll leave somebody out. But I've got some very special friends here tonight, and, and I appreciate you coming out here. One guy I'm going to mention is Scotty Sparks. Scotty Sparks is the preacher where I go to church. And my relationship with the pulpit minister everywhere I've ever attended, because I'm, I'm not a full-time church worker. I'm a bivocational minister. So I'm a part-time minister. I'm super part-time at Meridianville. And my, my relationship has been when they're out of town, when they get sick, whatever, I fill in for them. Scotty Sparks has officially filled in for me more than I filled in for him. I have not spoken at Meridianville yet this year because of my health adventures or my health misadventures. I'm supposed to speak Sunday, Scotty. And I was going to do this lesson. So you don't have to come because you're going to... Not. I'll do a different lesson since I've got so many Meridianville folks here, but I've, I had this one in the chamber. I, I got asked to speak at a youth rally in Dexter, Missouri. And they asked me to speak on the theme of being a spiritual camper in a physical campground. And so we did a lot of stuff about being sojourners and pilgrims. And, and, and I did part of this lesson for them, but I didn't do the marriage or the relationship aspect. And, and, and we'll do that. I spoke this morning for the capabilities and command, no, the, the combat capabilities command developmental group at the arsenal. They asked me to come do an annual training and talk to them about stress management. And, and part of what they're attached to is the aviation group. So they do a lot of work with helicopters and, and strike missiles and stuff. And they had a logo that looked like a, a triangular type patch with an anvil. And I said, now if you're working with airplanes and you're working with helicopters and you're dropping anvils, that's some wily e. coyote stuff. I said, y'all are my kind of people. I can relate to that. They didn't see the humor in it that I did, but they did give me a challenge coin with an anvil on it. So anyway, the wily e. coyote group. When, when I could relate to the fact that they had this anvil thing, I kind of see eye to eye with them. Uh, some of the things that, that, that I talked about, they already knew. I talked to a little couple, I believe right here, they've been married 67 years, and they're coming to a marriage seminar. One of my friends, as I was talking to them before church, said, well, we came to hear you, but I hope people don't think we're having trouble with our relationships. I said, well, you need to just get up in the middle of it and drop your Bible and walk out. Let everybody just kind of stare and see what happens. When I go to a seminar, I'm either going to get information or confirmation. I'm either going to get something I didn't know, or I'm going to figure out, hey, what I was doing is working already, and I need to keep doing it. There's a principle they call the KISS principle. Things I'm going to keep doing, things I'm going to start doing, things I'm going to stop doing. I've got a friend who's in real estate, and they have a meeting every year, and they say, all right, it's time to get kisses. What are we going to keep doing? What are we going to stop doing? What are we going to start doing? And so if we're going to get information about our relationships, I think it's good to find a source or find an expert relationship. Now, I'm not saying that I'm an expert on anything. I remember being an 18-year-old youth minister. I had a sermon entitled, Ten Commandments for Parents. And then I was a 22-year-old youth minister and had a toddler. I had a sermon called Five Suggestions for Parents. <laughs> and then I was a 30-year-old youth minister who had a teenager, and I said, let's hire an expert from out of town to come talk to her parents. So I'm not saying I've got it all figured out. But where we're going to start tonight is about a person or who's an expert in relationships. And the relationship they were in was incompatible almost irreconcilable differences. By the way, the statistic we'll talk about uh, on communication and conflict is that 70% of all marital problems are unsolvable. There's some things in relationship you're just not going to change. She's not going to become a morning person. He's not going to become organized. They're not going to not like football. There's some things that you're just not going to fix, things that you're not going to solve. So when we start talking about, you know, let's take an example of somebody who was in a relationship and the relationship had irreconcilable differences, how they made that work. And what I talked about with the group in, in Missouri was when God went camping. John chapter 1. John introduces us to the concept of the Logos. What the Greek-speaking world and the Greek-thinking world said, the, the Logos is the 
explanation of all the intellectual wisdom in the universe. And John said, let me introduce you to the Logos. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He says, you talk about this intellectual thing that, that, that is the, the prompt or the source of all intellectual wisdom in the universe. John said, let me give it a face, let me give it a name. The Logos is God. The Logos is the Son of God. And then in John chapter 1, verse 14, he does this thing. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John, when he talks about this, uses the word, if you translated it literally, he uses the word tabernacle. And he uses the word tabernacle as a verb. And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. That's just fun to say, by the way, tabernacled. The Word put on a tent and camped with us. God went camping. He left heaven, and He came down here, and He lived in one of these. Now, why did He do that? To gain a perspective of what it's like to be a human. When, when I teach de-escalation classes with the police, I talk about your conversations don't need to look like this. Your conversations need to look like that. You need to be able to demonstrate to the other person that you can see the world from their perspective. And until you can see the world from their perspective, you can't communicate and you can't meet their needs. Because until I understand your needs, until I walk in your shoes, until I see the world like you see it, I'm really more worried about my rights than your needs. And how many times do we conflict with one another about what I have the right to do rather than what you need from me? And so as, as God went camping, God put on a flesh tent and lived and, and you read the Gospels, and, and you, you humanize Jesus. He was hungry. He was tired. He was discouraged. He hears the news about John the baptizer being beheaded, and he goes to the wilderness by himself. He looks at his apostles and said, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even to the point of death. He had anxiety on the night he was going to be arrested and crucified. He's in the garden, and he's lying on his face, and he's praying to his Father, and he's praying, and he's in such distress that the sweat comes out of his forehead like great drops of blood, or he literally bursts the capillaries in his forehead and he bleeds sweat or sweats blood. That's a deep level of anxiety. So when we think about, does God understand me? Does God know me? Does God relate to me when I'm scared, sad, depressed, anxious, or weak? Yeah, God does, because God put on a tent. And he lived in a tent like you live in, and he lived in it for 33 years. In fact, the purpose of that is actually explained in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. He said, when you think about this high priest, you know, the original high priest in the Old Testament law, they didn't inherit land. They didn't have to cultivate land. They didn't have to raise crops. They lived in the tabernacle complex and eventually in the, in the temple complex, and they got their produce from the tithe offerings that the children of Israel brought in. And so a high priest could sit down in a counseling session, and he couldn't relate to the fact that, well, you know, I, I had to bring my best lamb here. They didn't have to give up their best lamb. They got all the best lambs. He couldn't relate to the fact, hey, my crop failed. He couldn't relate to the fact that, that I live on the border near the Philistines and they're bad neighbors. They were insulated and isolated from all those things. And when, when the Hebrew writer is writing to these Christians who were leaving Christianity and going back into a broken Jewish system, he says not only is Jesus superior in the way he communicates, not only is Jesus superior in his sacrifice, but Jesus is superior as a high priest because unlike the high priest that you're used to, he can relate to the human condition. And we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses. And it's not that Jesus wasn't tempted. It was not that Jesus wasn't vulnerable to temptation. It's he was tempted in all points like as we are and didn't sin. And so when God went camping, what he did was he came to the earth to understand living on the earth from a human perspective. 
And as he lived on the earth and experienced humanity, cruelty and rejection and prejudice and abuse and betrayal and faithlessness and friendship and compassion, that's how God was able to fix his relationship with us because we have irreconcilable differences. He's divine and we are not. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so as are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And so how did God learn what we need? Well, God lived like one of us. And he became the compassionate high priest. So if that's how God deals with me, how should I deal with my wife? How should I deal with my children? How should I deal with my parents? How should I deal with my congregants? I should make an attempt to try to understand from their perspective what their needs are. Now, young people, and, and I know you think, well, this is a marriage seminar. Why are you talking to young people? If you just understand from the, your parents' perspective, I did not know how vulnerable a man could be till I had a daughter. And if she gets bumped, I bruise. And if she gets scratched, I bleed. And if she gets scared, I'm terrified. And if something happens to her that I can't fix, I'm demoralized and helpless. And young people, if you just understood that when your parents say, hey, you got to come in at 10, or I don't like that crowd you're running with, or I wish you wouldn't watch that, if you could just see from their standpoint that everything that happens to you, they experience it, and they experience it on a level you can't, you can't ever comprehend that you have one of your own. And if you just simply said, hey, Mama and Dad want me in at 1030, because if you stay out till midnight, they don't sleep till you come in. They don't sleep till they hear that car pull up. They don't sleep till they hear that door close. You ever wonder why your parents dress so goofy? Because they spend the money for you to have trendy clothes. The first time my dad ever shot an automatic shotgun was a shotgun I gave him. He hunted with an old single shot shotgun, didn't have a bead on the front. I broke it open one time and it's printed 1889. He hunted with a hundred year old shotgun. I thought he hunted with it because it was magical. Because he could shoot at a rabbit, unload it and load it and get another shot at it if he missed. And I thought there was something magic about that gun, but he hunted with a hundred-year-old rabbit ear single-shot shotgun so I could have a baseball glove and ride a bicycle and have new blue jeans. And if you'd ever just take a breath and think about life from your parents' perspective, you wouldn't conflict with them as much. You wouldn't hassle them as much. I had a young man come to my office, and, and he was mad because his dad wouldn't pay his $250 fee to attend some athletic banquet. I said, you drive a car? He goes, yeah. So who pays insurance on that car? I said, my dad does. I said, well, every month. I've got a green light. Hey, wow. 
You shouldn't say that if you work around snipers, by the way. So, all right, we've got voice now. So understanding the world from somebody else's perspective. So young people, if you could ever just look at what your parents think is dangerous or, or the group of friends. And, and by the way, if, if, if you read the story of Balaam and he's riding a donkey and the donkey can see an angel and the donkey does some things that just drive Balaam crazy. He sits down, he lays down, he goes out of the way, he slides up against the wall and he crushes Balaam's foot. And finally God allows the donkey to talk. And, and, and he says, why have you struck me these four times? And Balaam says, because you've abused me. I don't think Balaam understands what the word abuse means, by the way. He's the one whacking on this poor donkey. And when God gives this donkey the ability to talk, he doesn't say, look, fool, there's an angel standing up there with a drawn sword. He's ready to die, slice, and julienne fry you. He says, have I ever acted this way before? And Balaam has to admit, no, ever since I've owned you, you've done well. And a lot of time an animal knows things you don't know and can see things you can't see. Sometimes they know there's a snake there. Sometimes they know how deep the water is. Sometimes they smell something. I'm amazed at what our little Spanish water dog knows about her environment. And if she barks out in the yard, something's in the yard that's, that's new. And it can be a bale of hay. It can be a bag blown over from the neighbors. It can be a random a squirrel. But if there's something new in her environment, she's going to warn us about it. When Balaam's donkey talks to him, he says, you think about ever since you've rode, ridden me, what kind of decisions did I make? Well, young people, when your mom and dad won't let you play in the street, won't let you cross the road without holding their hand, if they won't let you play Mr. Hairpin and Mr. Electrical Socket can be friends, everything your parents have ever done for you when you were little was because they could see something you couldn't see and knew something you didn't know. And so when you get to be a teenager and they say, I don't like that boy, I don't like you running with this crowd, I wish you wouldn't date that girl, you need to be in at 11 o'clock. Every decision they've ever made was in your best interest and the decisions they're making now that you feel so conflicted about, if you could share their perspective, it'd make you feel really, really different about what mom and dad think and know. And trust me, they know things you don't know and can see things you can't see. You need to trust them. Okay? And then back to the, the spouses. When I start interacting with my wife, if I try to understand her world, then I respond not based on what I have the right to do, but on what she needs me to do. Go, go to Peter's letter, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll, we'll spend the rest of our time there. And, and, and this is an awkward verse, and we don't like to read it. But Peter writes to, to couples... And he says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And do not let your adornment or your beauty be merely outward, arranging of the hair, wearing of gold, putting on fine apparel, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Peter writes and tells these women, he says, you need to learn something about submissiveness. And, and, and submissiveness here is not the idea that you're a second-class citizen or you're a doormat or, or that your husband comes in and he's the king of the castle. It's you need to understand that you get more influence with your husband when you're quiet and submissive and you have a beautiful inside person. You know, women think sometimes that, 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 that they get traction with men by telling us things and giving us lists. And all the ladies just laughed, <laughs> and all the men just shook their heads. This is not that you deserve this position. It's ladies, if you want to get a man to work for you, you've got to influence him, not badger him. In the garden, when Adam and Eve sinned, before Adam and Eve sin, God tells Cain, you be careful, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is to have you. He, he uses the imagery of a Babylonian threshold demon. And he says, Cain, you're safe where you're at, but because of what you've done with Abel, if you step out that door, there's this thing crouching, a lurking one, and its desire is to overcome you. When Adam and Eve sin... And God punishes them and he tells Eve, your desire shall be for your husband. That's not a sexual desire. That's the exact same Hebrew construction as this thing crouching at the door and it wants to overwhelm you, it wants to overcome you. 
He said, ladies, you're always going to struggle with the fact that you want to take the reins and run this thing. Why? Because Adam was the caretaker in the garden, and he abdicated his, his responsibility. Adam is standing close by when Eve chooses to talk to a snake and eat the forbidden fruit. And when God comes into the garden to call him into account of this, even though Eve sinned first, God calls Adam and says, hey, what happened here? And instead of Adam taking responsibility and saying, as the caretaker, I didn't do my job, I didn't protect this woman from this snake and this temptation, he says, well, it's your fault because you gave her to me. And he abdicated his responsibility, and as part of that consequence, it's a natural occurrence for the women to want to, 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 to overlord, for, for them to want to, to mother us, if you will. And we're lazy, and we'll let you do it. But what God says is, is, wives, you be submissive to your husbands. And even the ones that don't obey the word, you have influence with them without words. He does a play on words. He goes, even though they don't have the word, you can lead these guys without words because of your gentle and quiet spirit. And your beauty is not just something outward, it's something inward. Men are pretty shallow creatures. We're not super complicated. When we talk about his needs, her needs, the man's list is pretty shallow. And for the most part, and just kind of look around the room, and I don't want you to take this wrong at all, but I really don't care if you like me or not. But I do expect you to treat me with a modicum of respect. And if there's a guy out there and he wouldn't spit on me if I was on fire, and he'll treat me with respect, I can get along with him. Is that true, fellas? I'd, I'd rather be respected than liked. You know what I hear in marriage counseling? I go home and my home's the only place I'm not respected. Ladies, your influence with your husband comes from having a quiet and a gentle and a chaste spirit and not trying to overwhelm him when you decide that, hey, I can do things better. Now, the, the dynamic that happens between men and women is women only complain about things that they think have value. If a woman doesn't think it has any value, she's not going to say anything about it. She doesn't care about your race car. She doesn't care about your bass boat. She walked by it and let it dry rot. But if she thinks there's some value to it, she says, you know what we need to do with this? You know how we need to fix this? So women only talk about things they think have value. So when they come to you and say, in our relationship we need to do this, the only reason they brought it up is because they think it's valuable. But when a guy hears a woman talk about things that need to be fixed, what do we hear? I failed. I'm a loser. Oh, no. And what happens is we misinterpret this stuff. And because we misinterpret it and we're kind of avoidant of that leadership role, women get to see, well, he didn't listen, I'll tell him louder. He didn't listen, I'll tell him again. He didn't listen, I'll drop him a hint. Guys, don't take hints. Personal confession. I can tell you where I'm speaking in 2025. I know when my next bow fishing trip is. I know when the next UFC is on. I know what my counseling schedule is like in the next three weeks. And I forget the garbage truck comes on Monday mornings at 7.30. <laughs> and so to help me remember that, my wife will pull the garbage out of the can and she'll set it on the step outside of our garage door. And I open the door and there's this big garbage bag and I think, someone's challenged me to jump this and I'll jump it and go get in the car and go to work. No, it's a hint, you moron. Take the trash to the big green thing and roll it out there. But I don't pick up on those hints. But if she puts a note on the door, says, take the trash out, oh, chances are that bag will get ripped. <laughs> chances are let the dog get into it. Likewise, women, be submissive to your husbands that even if they don't obey the word, they can without a word be won over. Now, the interesting thing here, he says likewise. What does likewise mean? Likewise means like something else was going. So if you read before that, he talks, and the whole theme of 1 Peter is suffering. That if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to get used to the idea that you're going to endure some things that are inconvenient and unpleasant. Christianity is a contact sport. Your faith will not change your circumstances. Don't let your circumstances change your faith. But what he talks about here, he says, if you look at submission to government, chapter 2, verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 18, slaves submitting to their masters. 
And then Jesus submitting himself to the cross. When he uses the word likewise, he says, you've got to understand this is the perspective of married people. In the same way that you'd submit to the government, in the same way that if you ended up as a slave, you'd submit to your master, in the same way that Jesus submitted himself to the will of God because of the needs of the people, wives, you need to submit to your husbands, not because you need to, but because that's what your husbands need. And I don't think we understand how vulnerable men are and how insecure we are. And we are, okay? We don't have time to read it. But in uh, 2 Samuel, David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Now, David has done something incredible. He's united his clan, the clan of Saul. He solved a civil war in Israel. He's left the city of Hebron, and he's taken over the capital city of Jerusalem. And it's now his citadel. And he's decided that he's going to bring the Ark of the Covenant out of exile and bring it to Jerusalem and keep it in a tent beside his palace because he wants God's presence with him. And the first time he tries it, it's a problem because they put it on an ox cart. And as they start to move it, it hits a bump. A guy named Uzzah reaches out and touches it. He drops dead. And they just back off. And they leave it at this guy's house. And words comes to David, hey, the ark is at this guy's house, and he's prospering. Everything he's doing is growing. And David said, got to have the ark. So they go get the ark. This time they get it right. They carry it on poles with the priest. And as they come into the city of Jerusalem, David is in front of the ark, and he's leaping in the air, and he's dancing. And he's wearing a linen ephod. He's wearing a big, long nightshirt. And his wife is standing in their house and watches him come down the street dancing in front of the ark. And the Bible says, and she despised him in her heart. Now this is the lady that when it came time to marry her, he was so smitten with her that Saul, in an attempt to get him killed, said, well, if you're going to marry my daughter, you've got to bring me a dowry. And they're like, well, I'm a poor shepherd guy. My family's poor shepherds. He said, I don't need money. I want you to go. And I want you to single-handedly challenge some Philistines in hand-to-hand combat. And if you beat one, you cut something off of his body and bring it back to me. Brought back 200 war trophies. That means David is 200 and 0 in the UFC. He earns the right to marry this girl by challenging 200 different men and killing them. He likes this girl. You get that? And so he comes into Jerusalem, he's dancing in front of the ark. She looks out the window and she despises this display. He gets the ark there, he brings the people together, he blesses the people, he gives everybody in the audience a cake of figs and some meat, men and women. And that's opulent. I mean, he has really... Normally you just give that to the men. He gives it to the men and the women. This is huge. It may be the best, most significant day in his political life because he's combined Israel and he's brought God into his kingdom. And he goes home after this great celebration and his wife Michael meets him on the porch with a double hipper and a foot tapper. And she says, how glorious was the king of Israel today uncovering himself like one of the base fellows does in front of the handmaidens. Now, I don't think David was immodest. I think she's using hyperbole. What she's saying is, you led a parade... And instead of wearing your robe and your crown and your scepter, you wore blue jeans and a t-shirt and you're dancing like a fool. And David responded to her, well, when you think about who God could have chosen as the next king, he didn't choose anybody with your family's last name. In other words, your dynasty ended and God chose me. And if I want to dance in front of the Lord, I'll dance in front of the Lord. And you think the handmaiden's got a show today? Wait till Friday night. And then the Bible says she went to her grave childless. If you can't figure out what that means, it means he quit having sex with her. This is a woman that he loved and adored and killed 200 men in order for the right to marry her hand. And he comes into Jerusalem and she meets him with this disrespect and it makes him respond to her in such a way that he doesn't go back into her bedroom. Now listen, folks, if there's a secure dude in the Old Testament, it's David. He's a warrior, he's a poet. He's a musician. He's a giant killer. He's the only Old Testament king that does not die in battle. He's a warrior king. And yet this woman's disrespect, this woman's lack of admiration for him in this instance, is kind of a deal breaker with David. 
Now, if the warrior king of Israel can be that insecure, what do you think a five foot four bald headed dude can be? What do you think the guy you're married is vulnerable to? Because we live and die in your eyes and with your respect or your disrespect. And it's not because you need to be submissive, it's because we need that kind of admiration and that kind of respect in our home or we don't work very well. It's not your fault, it's ours, but that's the way it works. Keep reading, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, oh boy, there's that mirror image word again. In the same way that the wives have to be sensitive to what you need, and in the same way that you're sensitive to the government, in the same way that you're sensitive to your master, in the same way that Jesus was sensitive to the will of God, husbands, in the same way, just like the wives are submissive to you, you've got some submission to do. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding. There's the word. I'm going to dwell with my spouse, and I'm going to not look at the world from my perspective, but I'm going to understand her world. And affection to a woman is whether or not I get your world and respond to it from your perspective. How important is it to see your mother on Mother's Day? How important is it that we spend time with the children as a family? How important is it that you buy me little gifts? How important is it that we have physical touch that is non-sexual? And all of a sudden, understanding, and, and if you've ever read the book Love Languages... It talks about that different people have different ways to say I love you and different ways to hear I love you. In the book Love Languages, it's uh, quality time, physical touch, gifts, acts of service, and, and words of ad admiration. And you'll notice that your spouse often communicates to you in the way that you wish they, they would, you would communicate with them. And I don't want to be creepy or make anybody uncomfortable, but I like to have my shoulders rubbed. I've got little bitty bunchy muscles and they get knotted up. Now, if you rub my shoulders, I want you to squeeze it so hard that you find bone in there. Okay? Because I've got knotty, tough, rough muscles. And I, I like, in order for Jackie to rub my shoulders, I have to lay on the floor, hold the couch, and she sits on the couch and puts her heels in my shoulders and pushes because her little hands aren't strong enough. Now, if I lay in the floor in front of her while she's watching March Madness basketball, I can get a workout because <laughs> she'll just grind her feet when them Razorbacks are on that court. You know how she likes her back rubbed? She likes to feel like there's a granddaddy spider river dancing on her. And so when I sit down and she rubs my back and she's not paying attention, guess how she rubs my back? And she's wasting my time. I think one of my hairs back here is messing up. And I sit down to rub her back. She goes, oh, that hurts not so hard. I rub your back like I want my back rubbed, and you rub your back, my back like you want your back rubbed. That's love languages. And when I understand that Jackie rubs my back this way, that's probably how she wants hers rubbed. That's attunement. That's understanding. That's figuring it out. And you'll be surprised that, that sometimes we think we're saying I love you, and we miss it. You know, I, literally, this happened in my office. Sat down with a lady and said, Does your husband love you? She said, No, he doesn't. I said, How would you prove that? Well, he works 90 hours a week. We hadn't been on vacation in three years. He doesn't go to a softball game or a dance recital. Oh, okay. She goes out, sits in the lobby. He comes in. Do you love your wife? Absolutely. Prove it. Man, I work 90 hours a week. I'm so busy, I haven't been on vacation in three years. I can't go to a basketball game or a dance recital. And all of a sudden, he's screaming, I love you, and she's here, and I don't care anything about you. Because she'd rather him spend time with her than make all this money. And this really boils down to sitting down and having a conversation with each other. How do you like your back rubbed? What do you need from me? And when I understand your needs and respond to it, I'm doing what God did. I, I'm, I'm living in your tent. You have a compassionate high priest that understands your weaknesses. And that's not just your needs, but it's your vulnerabilities and your fears, and your insecurities. And if I know those things and respond to them, I'm treating you like God treated me because I'm seeing the world from your perspective. Now, when you talk about meeting needs, in Willard Harley's survey, his needs, her needs, he surveyed 10,000 people, 5,000 couples, and came up with this astounding conclusion that men and women are different. <laughs> Where have I been? 
And men have different needs than women. The man's list, sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, an attractive spouse, domestic support, and admiration. Men get married with the assumption they're going to be sexually active. And a man under a certain age, if he's not sexually active, something is psychologically wrong, something is physiologically wrong, or he's having sex somewhere else. And I'll borrow money to bet on that. So gentlemen, be careful of that porn stuff. Because what it does, it creates an a instant fulfillment that requires no commitment. And it never says no, and it never rejects you. And you compare fantasy to reality, and fantasy always wins. Be, be super careful, fellas. Now, ladies, when he married you, he married you with the assumption we're going to have sex. And, and unfortunately, the person in the relationship who's least interested in sex controls it. Now, that's a bad dynamic there. But you think about it, if I only got to hunt as much as Jackie was interested in it, I might as well sell my guns. If she only got to shop for a spring outfit as often as I change, for, this is my spring outfit. This is my winter outfit, I'll put gloves on. This is my summer outfit, I'll put sunglasses on. I don't, I, I mean, that's it. But now she's got a closet that is, you know, when her dad died, she was in Auburn taking a class, and she called and said, hey, I just got word my dad passed away, I'm headed to Arkansas. I said, well, don't go without me. She said, well, I'm already in the car. I said, look, I've got friends who'll drive me to Birmingham, we meet in Birmingham, we'll be in the same car, I'll go out there and go back. She said, okay, bring me some clothes. I said, all right, she goes, go to my closet. Go to the blue section. She has a blue section in her closet. She has a red section and a green section. I have shirts that button and shirts that don't. That's how my clothes are organized, okay? And, and so if she only got to shop with my, interest, my level of interest, she wouldn't shop at all. But when I got married as a young husband, I recognized how important it was for her to have a spring wardrobe, a fall wardrobe, and a winter wardrobe. It didn't mean anything to me. So the person least interested in something often controls it in that attunement, looking at it from your standpoint. Number two, recreational companionship. Men build relationships by doing. That, that's how we describe our friendships. This is my friend we hunt together. This is my friend we fish together. This is my friend we golf together. Now, when men do things together, it's really, really weird. Because me and Greg go hunting together. We'll drive to the woods. He'll walk a mile that way. I'll walk a mile that way. We'll spend four hours in utter silence. And we've been hunting together. <laughs> and we're friends. <laughs> you know, if me and Barry are sitting in a bass boat, and it's been two hours, and Barry goes, are we okay? One of us is getting in the water, I'm telling you right now. But we, we, we ask you to go with us when we're dating you. And you sit in our bass boats, and you ride in our golf carts, and you watch us play softball, and you bring a plate of sandwiches over while we're changing the transmission. And we go home thinking, man, this beautiful creature is doing all this stuff my smelly gorilla friends do with me, and she's way more interesting to look at. I think I'll keep that one. But when we get married, you start nesting and raising babies, and then you quit going with me. And you quit being my companion. You quit being my friend. And then you invest a lot of your time into the kids. I feel like the odd man out. We go this way, then the house is empty. And I live in a, a house with somebody who's not my friend. You got to date your man, married just like you do when you were dating. And it may be something as simple as going out and get ice cream with him. It may be as simple as holding his hand and going for a walk. It may be as simple as just sitting on the porch. But men want your company. You know, I don't want Jackie's help. I want Jackie's presence. I'm going to do this thing in the garage. Come out there and be with me. Well, what am I supposed to do? You just be with me. Well, she's got the attention span of a weather vane, so I have to keep her occupied. You know, you need to hold this or you need to measure that or whatever. But I like her just to be with me and involved in my life. Men also want an attractive spouse. Now, this doesn't mean you've got to have a certain dress size or weigh a certain thing. It's just a simple fact that when we're dating, we don't get to see you until you're fixed up. And we spend a lot of our time waiting on you to get ready. But then after we're married, the curlers come out, the fuzzy terry cloth robe and the bunny slippers I remember the first time that showed up at my house I said honey don't move I think I can get it <laughs> my mother gave this to me you know and I mean ladies your husband is visually stimulated and if you're not looking beautiful for him he's going to look at somebody else and that has nothing to do with your dress size or what you look like when you were 18 it's do you make an effort to be presentable and then he wants domestic support now we give lip service 
to I have a career, you have a career, and, and we live in the same house. But in the back of his lizard brain, he feels like that you will do things in his home that his mother did. Now, I'm not saying he's right or he's accurate. That's just the way he's wired. Now, before you get mad at me about that, start throwing songbooks. If there's a bump in the night, who has to check it? Jonesy, Jonesy. And my wife won't nudge me. She pats my belly. I've had 15 abdominal surgeries, and I hate for my belly to be touched. Jonesy, Jonesy, Jonesy. Something woke me up. There's a Bonelli shotgun in the corner. Go clear the house. You know how. No, no, no. You don't understand. It woke me up. So my job is to find what woke me up? Yes. Founder. <laughs> you woke me up. But no, because I'm the guy. I check all bumps in the nights and deal with all vermin. Why? That's a male-dominated role. So in our minds, there's some female-dominated roles. And science has proven that if you'll just define those expectations and those roles and stick to them, you'll have a happier marriage. Now what we did is, here's all the things we do in the house. On a scale of 1 to 10, how bad do you hate it? And I do the things that she hates, and she does the things that I hate. Now if we tie on it, then we have to flip a coin or arm wrestle or something like that. But in the back of my mind, I think she's going to do some things like my mom did it. And then the fifth need for a man is admiration. We, we want you to treat us like we're somebody special. We want you to treat us with respect and admiration. We don't want you to belittle us and demean us. That doesn't mean you can't tease us. But when you get out in public and you start belittling us about things we do, that's a, that's a deal breaker. Now, fellas, let's be honest about ourselves. Play with me. Play with me. Look good for me, clean up after me, and tell me I'm great. <laughs> That's pitiful. Ladies, if you can't do that, you shouldn't have pets, all right? Because we are simple, simple creatures. The problem is her list of needs. Number one for her is affection. And affection is, it involves not sex, but affection. I built this tower in my backyard. I have to know some engineering to do that. It's, a, it's got three class two poles. It's got three levels. It's got a zip line. It's got a swing set up that doesn't have a vector pull. I've got a 20-foot, 20 24-inch black tube suspended by one cable that the kids slide down. It has a trap door and a barn door. You can do an emergency exit and go down a fast rope. It's an engineering marvel in my backyard. But my kitchen sink has been dripping for three months. Not true. I, I fixed it. But she's got this thing that says, oh, he can do all that, but he won't address this. Clean my rifles, but won't do dishes. She gets that message. I write a sermon, write a blog, can't send her a birthday card. When you respond to your wife with, hey, I see your world and I respond to it because you like gifts or touches or snuggling or whatever, her number one need from you is affection. Her number two need, gentlemen, is conversation. Because women build intimacy by talking where men build intimacy by doing. So when she's riding in your golf cart and riding in your bass boat and she's watching you do all these things, you're in your comfort zone, so what do you start doing? You start talking. And she knows your hopes, and she knows your dreams, she knows your fears, she knows your insecurities. And then after you get married, did you have a good day? Yeah. What'd you do? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Well, no, if you don't talk to your wife like you did when you were dating, then you've robbed her from the expectation she had, is this what my married life's going to be like? Because she would go home and tell her girlfriends, I met the most wonderful guy, we can talk about anything. And when she starts sharing your secrets, she's expecting you to share secrets with her. But we get married, and we disconnect from that. And it's not just enough that we listen to them, fellas, but we listen and respond, and we also respond with details. Her number three need is openness and honesty. A deal breaker in your marriage is if your wife can't trust you. Period. And that's what'd you spend, where'd you go, who you're talking to, who'd you have lunch with. If I've dealt with a hundred couples who've had affairs, one lady out of a hundred will come into that office and say, I can't believe he had sex with another woman. Ninety-nine of those ladies will say, I can't believe he lied to me. He said he was here, but he was there. He said he was going to do this, but he was doing that. 
And a woman cannot live with a man she cannot trust. She can forgive almost anything else. But she left her home, she left her girlhood friends, and she left her last name to follow you on your adventure. And she can't trust you when you walk out of the house or open up your browser or tell her you're going to work or tell her you're staying late. That is a deal breaker in a relationship if she can't trust you. Number four in her list of needs is financial security. Now, she'll give lip service. I've got a career, you've got a career. But in the back of her mind, if she grew up in a stable home, she expects you to do some financial things like her dad did. And she expects you to be the breadwinner. And, and fellas, that means be the breadwinner. That doesn't mean look for the perfect job. That doesn't mean look for the convenient job. That means work two jobs. If you've got a roof houses and dig ditches, she left her family and a dad who took care of her, assuming you'd had that job. And if you don't work hard and you don't have a good work ethic and you're lazy and you're not a good provider for her and the children, that's going to be a problem. Because even though she has a job, she expects you to be the man and take responsibility for that. And then her fifth need is family commitment. She's got to believe in her heart of hearts that if you have to choose between anything else, you'll always choose her first. You'll choose her over your kids. You'll choose her over your friends. You'll choose her over your career. You'll choose her over your mom. But if she feels like she occupies any place other than first in your life, she, she won't be able to live with you. Gentlemen, your number one responsibility on this planet is to God. And your number one responsibility to God is her. Paul himself said, look, if you're going to minister to the gospel, it'll be better if you weren't married. Because people who are married have to put their spouse first and then the gospel. Because your first responsibility to God is, is to her. Now, you could pick my right hand or my left hand and pick a number one through five and take one of those needs away. And one of those needs affect the other. Now, this is not quid pro quo, but they are interrelated. And you end up that if you lose one of those needs, something on this side is effective, and you get catastrophic system failure. And affairs take place not because somebody is sexually inflamed, but because they're hanging out with somebody who meets one of those needs. He's at work, and this little intern that they hired at the arsenal admires him because he's a high-level engineer, and he gets that admiration from her. Or she gets this affection. Oh, oh, you're trying to change that? Let me change that oil for you. Let me carry that out to the car for you. Oh, you look nice today. Is that a new dress? And affairs take place not because we're in bad relationships. Affairs take place because we're good at relationships. People who can make conversation can make conversation. People who can flirt know how to flirt. You've got to put a fence around it. But what happens is when one of my needs isn't being met and somebody offers to meet that need even unconsciously, that's how affairs get started because I'm not meeting you. I'm not understanding you. I'm not responding to you based on your needs. Now, I probably have preached over time tonight. I forgot to set my clock up. Let, let me wrap this up with something other than marriage. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, when he talks about the compassionate high priest, he, he does something really interesting here. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So you've got this high priest who came to earth and he did not sin. Now, if I can do something that you can't do, how should I respond to you? Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. See, Jesus didn't say, hey, I was sinless, why can't you be? Jesus says, I was sinless, you don't have to be. In my relationship with my spouse, if I understand this vulnerability, if I understand this weakness, if I understand this insecurity, instead of responding to, I can't believe that bothers you, it, it doesn't have to bother you, I'm going to let it bother me, I'm going to take care of it because I'm going to meet your needs. Does that make sense? And so when you think about that Jesus was the perfect high priest, he doesn't take his perfection and say, I attain this, why can't you? He said, because I could do it and you couldn't, you can come to me any time that you need grace, mercy, or help in the time of need. 
because Jesus is compassionate because he understands our world of imperfection. And if we understand our spouse's insecurities, vulnerabilities, and imperfections, and we respond to that, we are treating them like Jesus treated us. And that's where we put their needs above our rights. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this, and, and I'll close. You guys know where the Devil's Tower is? You see uh, Escape to Witch Mountain and uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind? That's that big rock. It's out in Wyoming. The Indians say that it was a giant rock and the devils lived there. They call it the Devil's Tower. Or one of the Indian legends is that a giant bear clawed those grooves in it. It's a volcano that went extinct and the lava hardened up and the outside of the lava eroded from it. If you climb the Devil's Tower, and it's 800 feet if you do the vertical side, if you climb the Devil's Tower, there's a book at the top and you put your name in the book. My name is in the book at the top of Devil's Tower. And I've never been to it. A guy that I taught to climb named Troy Farmer was out west. He waited three days for the weather to clear and he climbed that thing. When he got to the top of it, he put my name in the book. I'm standing here today because of my friend Lonnie Jones. And I got a picture of that. I've never been to it. I don't have to climb it. My name's already in the book. You don't have to do some things because your compassionate high priest has already done them. He's already put your name in the book. And he understands your weakness. He understands your vulnerabilities. And he understands your insecurities. And he said, I'm willing to do this for you so you don't have to. I do that for my spouse. I do that for my friends. I do that for people in my congregation. I do that for people in the neighborhood. I do that for my parents. And God did it for me. And if you're here and you feel inadequate and you feel insecure and you think, well, I'm just a train wreck as a person, Jesus, as a compassionate high priest, says, I lived here, I know what you're going through, and I didn't sin, and because I didn't sin, I got to go pass through the heavens. I'm in the presence of my Father, and if you need something, grace, mercy, or help in the time of need, guess who you get to go to and ask for it? Because he understands our needs. And if you have a need tonight in your relationship with your Father, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.